Greetings to everybody. I'm not going to say good afternoon because there's very little goods in this afternoon today. While Russia continues its full-scale invasion of Ukraine and sieges Kyiv, G7 leaders stepped up their responses and launched further sanctions against Putin, who has put himself on the wrong side of history. So today we want to discuss about what's next, how to make sure that Putin is on the right, wrong side of history, how we can better support Ukraine, and what should our European allies do to stop and deter continued Russian aggression? Before we start, I would like to thank our partners from the Elkano Royal Institute and, and ESPI for partnering with us on this event. Today with me, I have a set of brilliant speakers. We have uh, Ivan Miklos, who is former Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of the Slovak Republic and former Chief, Chief Economic Advisor to the Ukrainian Prime Minister. We also have Ambassador Alessandro Minuterizzo, who is Senior Advisor at ESPI and President at the NATO Defense College Foundation. And we have Charles Power, who is Director of the Elkana Royal Institute. My name is Alina Kutsko. I'm Vice President of Globsec and Director of the Globsec Policy Institute. Without further ado, I would like to jump straight into the conversation. We're going to have a quick round of questions and answers with our speakers, and I do encourage all the participants and viewers of the live stream pose the questions either in the Zoom chat or uh, in our live stream channels, and we will be picking them up and trying to bring into the conversation. I would like to go first to Ivan Miklas, uh, who is now in Bratislava and so literally right closest to the physically to the, con uh, to the conflict that is happening uh, in Ukraine. Ivan also spent a lot of time in Ukraine advising the Ukrainian government on the set of the reforms. But I want to uh, talk to Ivan a little bit and ask you about uh, the Central Euro European perspectives on what's going on in Ukraine. What you think is going to happen next? What Central European countries are preparing for? And what Central Europeans are ready to do for Ukraine, but also for themselves? Thank you, thank you, Elena. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, first question is, of course, very difficult because to predict what uh, Putin will do is really not easy. Just uh, two days ago on Wednesday, I wrote an article for Slovakian Daily, Denik N, where I wrote that I don't know what will happen, but surely Putin will do something because his position after recognizing the, the separatist republics became worse than it was before, because he lost leverage, which he had before to using this in the so-called Minsk, Minsk process. And then he also, after recognizing these two republics, he unified Ukrainians even more as they have been before, and he unified Western countries against him, and sanctions have been imposed. I mean, these sanctions which have been imposed in Tuesday, Wednesday. Which means it was for me clear that he will do something, but I didn't know, didn't know, of course, what. And I was shocked. Yesterday, early in the morning, I was shocked as almost everybody. Which means this is also a reason why predictability of what this kind of personality, which is not limited by any democratic institutions, responsibility to the vote to voters, and, and nothing like that, is really, really difficult to predict. Which is important reason for to be prepared uh, prepared for the worst. This is maybe only conclusion, but, but what we can say that in this kind of situation, in the relation with this kind of person, it is necessary to be prepared for the worst. From the perspective of Central European countries, what does it mean? First, it means that now it is clear how important was and is uh, membership of the Central European countries in NATO, because NATO is only guarantor and guarantee against this uh, this uh, war crimes from the from Putin's regime. Because we have seen in his speech, two speeches, uh, that uh, he he is sharing some really really crazy visions of the of the the Russian Imperia and, and, and this kind of issues. Which means membership is the key. Another important point is that. We have seen, and, and hopefully it will help, at least in this, in this aspect, that we have in all these Central European countries, but especially in Slovakia, we have a lot of people who have been under Russians' propaganda and conspiracy theories' propaganda and, and uh, Putin's trolls' propaganda 
Because just two weeks ago in Slovakia, it was published public opinion polls by which more people are convinced that responsibility for the tensions, at that time only tensions between Russia and, and Ukraine, that the responsibility is on the side of US and NATO. 44% in Slovakia of people have been convinced about this. Just 35% said that it is responsibility of, of Russia. Now I think it is clear, unfortunately, by this tragic event, but it is clear where on which side the responsibility is. And how to help, how to help, and this is a very important conclusion from this, is that our government, and not only government, civil society, everybody has to be much, much more active in the fighting against those Kremlin trolls and, and, and people who are either, either, either useful idiots or even agents paid by, 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 by Kremlin and, and power and Putin, Putin's power. And last point, how to help, how to help Ukraine and how especially we can, can help Ukraine now. First, of course, to be to support as strongest sanctions against Putin's regime and against Russia as possible. Sanctions itself will not solve the, the, the problem, will, will not stop Putin. But sanctions, as strict as possible, as strong as possible, sanctions are unavoidable. Not sufficient, but unavoidable. Then another important um, tool or method, what to do is to help Ukraine as much as possible, which means help militarily, help uh, uh, financially, help by humanitarian, humanitarian aid. Of course, militarily, not by direct involvement in the, in the in the war and operations because because ukraine is not nato member but by equipment by weapons by by anything what what they what they what they need now i think this combination of these two tools and of course uh, to to express solidarity uh, and sympathy and to help uh, refugees and and everybody uh, and to, to help also i mean Persons and it is going on also not only in Slovakia all over the world they are they are they are they are some collection of of, of support and contribution to the to Ukrainian institutions uh, Ministry of Defense soldiers and so on so on. Thank. Thank you so much, Ivan. And so I want to connect what you're saying to uh, and pose a question next to Ambassador Minuturit. So you were saying that uh, one important lesson that we learned is that uh, Putin's behavior is unpredictable. So we need to be prepared for the worst. And also you mentioned that uh, in many countries, the importance of NATO uh, became unquestionable right now, which in a way may be a positive development for the ability of the European Union to uh, boost its own uh, defense capabilities, definitely not in the short run, but definitely in the mid and longer run. And I want to go to Ambassador Minuto Rizzo first. Ambassador, I wanted to pick up your brain a little bit on the uh, your military assessment of the situation. Of course, Ukrainians are putting up a rather brave fight, and uh, uh, given the uh, capabilities of the Russian forces, uh, they are doing a remarkable job in making sure that they can resist the aggression as much as possible. But the questions that many are asking is for how long this can continue and uh, whether there is a chance that uh, Ukrainians with their military capabilities and with the military help by the Western countries be able to resist for a sufficiently long time. And the second question that I have for you is uh, your reflections, uh, given your NATO experience, on uh, what are the emergency plans that NATO is preparing and what are the plans for the reinforcement of the Eastern flank? Well, um, good morning, first of all. Good afternoon. I don't know the panel, the way you want to, <laughs> you want to say that. Uh, well, you know, I think that... Um, what we see coming from Brussels, yesterday there was a summit of the European Union, today there is a NATO summit. So I think that we are reacting in a proper way uh, because there is a show of unity uh, that perhaps uh, Putin was not uh, imagining at the beginning. Uh, there is a, a lot of unity, everybody speaks about uh, imposing sanctions, about, you know, showing that we are strong, we want to react, but even more than that, because, you know, sanctions are inevitable, and we all know that is part of 
of what we have to do. But it's not the end of the story. The real story, I think, in the end, is the political reaction and the way we will, in the future, uh, be united and and uh, and and confront this situation. And I think that my view, at least, uh, the president of Russia has made a strategic mistake because he will, he may win over Ukraine because Ukraine is a weak country, you know, unfortunately, but he will be a party of the international community, I'm afraid, because um, nobody seems to be, to be on his side. Because even the Chinese, who are, you know, the, the allies, if I put it that way, if you look at the statements, official statements of the Chinese government, in fact, they are rather balanced. They invite both parties to moderation, you know, to scale down the tone. So this is not exactly what an ally, you know, is supporting another ally. So this is an important thing. And then, you know, many people, even in my country, you know, are thinking about the possibility that, you know, Putin goes beyond Russia, beyond Ukraine. But I don't think that we'll ever dare to go beyond that. So I think that Slovakia has not to be afraid, I think, because uh, it is inconceivable. I mean, that uh, um, even a dictator, as Putin is, let's put it clearly in that way, cannot dare to think that he can attack a NATO country because that would be immediately an Article 5 reaction. There is no discussion about that. So I think that this Slovak, I understand very well and I have lived in your country in the past as an Italian diplomat, you know, for many years, so I know you very well. I don't think you have to be afraid about that. Uh, certainly, the issue is uh, what is going to happen. My impression, and of course you in, in Bratislava, you, you, you may know as much as me and even more perhaps, is what is the internal situation in Russia? Because the impression that I have, and no, I'm not alone in having this impression, is that the president has decided the invasion even against the opinion of some of his top advisors. Uh, and even people like Karaganovich, for instance, the chairman of Council of Foreign Relations, is a, a few days ago had written that, you know, Ukraine was not really the issue. The issue was a new system of security in Central Europe, you know, and you know all that, you know what it means, uh, Helsinki too, and this kind of things. So uh, I think that they have been taken by surprise in a way. Also because there is another thing that you know very well, but it is important, I think, to react. Yes. Uh, Russia has an important leverage in terms of energy. And for instance, my country is very much affected by dependency on Russia. You know, we import, I think, 35 or something percent of our, of our need. But, you know, besides that, uh, Russia remains uh, a weak country from an economic point of view. Um, somebody says Gabon with an atomic bomb. That's too much, perhaps. But it's not a strong economy. So in a way... Uh, our sanctions are not going to affect them as much as we think, I'm afraid. On the other hand, uh, the country has no such power. So, uh, they, you know, uh, I'm, I have been told that China, uh, the economy of China, the gross national power of China is rising every year one Russia. So can you imagine the imbalance there is between the two countries, you know? Uh, and so I think that in the end, it is a faux pas. Uh, of Putin. Now, of course, I think we are all today, I mean, uh, Friday, thinking about what will happen next in Ukraine. And of course, I have no crystal ball and, you know, everybody's guess is, is equal. Um, I think that they, Putin doesn't know himself what to do exactly. He will go day by day. And this may be dangerous because when emotions, I've seen this on September 11, when emotions take place, uh, you don't know what will going to happen less. So I'm afraid, uh, you know, about human losses, about suffering of the people and all that. Uh, but, you know, we have, I think, on our side, I mean, to, to, to uh, express support as much as we can, and at the same time, continue to show political unity. This is the basis of that, to show them that uh, this move uh, is the wrong move. And uh, the fact that we had in Moscow some Pacific demonstration, even by a small group of people, is something new. 
because so far we know Russia very well. I mean, we are all on the same general culture. Russia has always invested on foreign policy and on being proud of being a superpower, even at some economic cost. But now I think that the Russian people may be starting to see that this is a not right policy to proceed in 2022. I will stop here for the moment. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Indeed, it seems the longer it lasts, the higher the costs are for Putin, not just because of the sanctions, but also the cost of waging the war and controlling the territory. And what we do see at home does give hope that, as you said, in the end, it's a big faux pas. And uh, despite the increase in repression at home, the overstretchedness of Putin efforts will lead to, for him, unfortunate end. But I want to go now to Charles Powell and uh, uh, follow up what we already started discussing in terms of the political unity in the West, but also a set of sanctions that the EU is unleashing now as a tool for punishment and as a tool to increase the cost on Putin. Can you elaborate a little bit uh, how united we are in our unity, uh, whether Putin is failing entirely on this front, and what do you think the EU can do more with, in a way that would support Ukraine even further? Thank you very much, uh, Lena. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, let me thank Globsec for this initiative and for your very timely open letter, which I was very pleased to sign up to. I'm afraid to say that a lot of the things I've been hearing are, I think, overly optimistic and overly sanguine, frankly. Um, it's, as you've all been saying, it's very difficult to predict exactly what's going to happen, but uh, I would say the most likely scenario is that uh, Russia is going to take out the Ukrainian government and try to install some kind of puppet regime. Um, there is a lot of talk of uh, partitioning Ukraine as well. That would be another option. I admit, I acknowledge that occupying and controlling a country of 600,000 square meters, square kilometers, sorry, with a population of 43 million is no easy task. And this would require a massive military um, um, exercise on the part of, of Russia. But um, you know, given everything we've been seeing in the last few days and weeks, I think that is where we are heading, I'm afraid. So a few quick remarks then about what we can do as, as EU member states and perhaps what the EU can do as an institution. First of all, aid, um, as Ivan was saying, um, obviously, we're not going to offer um, troops. Um, there's, we aren't going to offer any kind of no-fly zone, which is probably really the only thing that would save Ukraine right now. And therefore, some member states individually um, are offering some military assistance in terms of military hardware, uh, and other countries will do less, for example, the Ukrainian embassy here in Madrid has requested helmets, bulletproof vests, binoculars, and goggles, um, which is really almost you know, heart-wrenching um, to hear this kind of very modest demand coming from them, given what they are going to endure in the next uh, few days and weeks. Um, and obviously, we can offer financial assistance. I've just read that Finland has offered 50 million uh, US dollars in economic aid, which the Ukrainian government will be free to invest as it sees fit. So I would obviously like EU member states to do this on a large scale individually, and hopefully perhaps the EU collectively as well. Secondly, there's the question of refugees. Um, and this I think is going to be crucial. According to the RAND Corporation, between three and five million Ukrainians will probably seek um, refuge in neighboring countries. And that, of course, affects you in Slovakia. I understand Romania, Croatia, and Poland have already made um, concrete offers of assistance. And I think this is going to be absolutely crucial. Of course, this is a tricky one for the EU. Our own refugee and asylum policy is in tatters. We have been unable, frankly, um, to redefine or to define a workable refugee and asylum policy in the last couple of years. So this is not the best possible uh, context in which to have to face this new challenge, but obviously um, it's not a crisis of our making. Thirdly, sanctions. The problem with sanctions, as we all know, is that it's a two-way street. Um, the more we sanction Russia, the more some of our own companies um, will, will suffer as well. 
However, I really think that I'm actually quite surprised at how slow we've been in the EU. Um, this debate about SWIFT is frankly not terribly relevant. Um, SWIFT wouldn't, removing Russia from SWIFT would not have a crippling impact on the Russian economy. What I really want to stress is two things here. First of all, Russia has doubled its reserves, gold and in, in terms of gold and foreign currency, and it has de-dollarized its reserves. So that's very important. Secondly, um, it has Chinese alternatives to SWIFT. It might make some transactions more expensive, but there are, they can they have uh, you know ways of getting around this. <clears throat> and even you know, 80 million Russians now have their own Russian credit cards. So um, you know, to some extent, Russia has been decoupling itself selectively from Europe. And this, I think, is the bottom line. This is what we have to really discuss amongst ourselves in the EU. How far are we Europeans willing to go in decoupling from Russia? And this, of course, the, the, the bear in the room, forgive the pun, is uh, gas and energy, of course. Um, as we've seen, the Russians um, shrugged off um, Schultz's decision to stop uh, Nord Stream 2. They argued that basically European demand for gas is likely to increase in the next five years or so, and that we have nowhere else to go. Um, of course, we in Europe are claiming that we do have other sources like um, Qatar and um, the United States and Norway and elsewhere, um, maybe more liquefied natural gas, but this remains to be seen. So I think this is really the debate. Fourthly, and I'm thinking of Belarus, for example, the way, the very brave and generous way in which Lithuania has responded to events in Belarus. Um, if my very dark scenario is, is accurate, in other words, if basically we have, uh, if you like, regime change in Ukraine and um, Ukraine's independence and freedoms are destroyed, which I fear is the most likely scenario now, they will need safe havens abroad. For example, there is already talk of removing their digital infrastructure, infrastructure and taking it abroad um, in order to maintain some sort of um, a viable Ukrainian resistance. So I think again here, countries in the immediate neighborhood will play a crucial role. Um, fifthly, disinformation. We in Europe have begun to acquire institutional and methodological procedures to combat disinformation. Disinformation is going to be at the heart of um, Russia's policy towards Europe uh, in the next probably decades now. Um, and therefore, we in the EU need to step up our investment in disinformation um, uh, in, in, and, and share that, of course, with our Ukrainian friends. Um, seventhly, or sixthly, uh, one of the questions I'm asking myself is, myself is what impact will all of this have on the EU's debate about strategic autonomy? How much appetite is there going to be in a country like Slovakia, Elena, I will ask you? Um, to consider, even consider strategic autonomy when it's now become painfully clear that um, there is a very real Russian threat on your borders. So my assumption is that there will be less appetite going forward and that most member states, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, will be um, very wary of doing anything that might weaken NATO or might um, raise questions about US commitment to the security of uh, your region. So I think in future, we will see more emphasis on the digital, industrial, technological dimensions of strategic autonomy and less, influence, uh, less emphasis on the kind of um, approach that President Macron was advocating. And finally, you mentioned uh, in your introduction this idea um, of offering the Ukrainians um, candidate status um, right, recognize them now as candidates for EU membership. Well, I'm afraid that's too little too late. Um, you know, that might have had some genuine symbolic power, some genuine symbolic clout a few months, a few years ago, um, but I'm afraid that's no longer of any practical use. So I'm very sorry that I can't be more upbeat about this, uh, but that's basically where I think we are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. Can I throw back at you one small additional question? I think mm -hmm. Ambassador mentioned that uh, even Chinese are not fully endorsing uh, Russian actions. At the same time, Chinese are not fully unendorsing the Russian actions either. 
Can you uh, elaborate uh, about your views or Western European views about the potential synergies mm -hmm. between Russia and China in political ways, but also as a way for Russia to obviate the sanctions? Yes, I basically agree with what the ambassador said. Um, in other words, we shouldn't assume that this is going to lead to a much, much closer uh, Chinese-Russian alliance. Um, there are very deep-rooted fundamental reasons for Chinese-Russian rivalry, geopolitical, geoeconomic rivalry. Um, and I think you know, those, those should never be um, lost sight of. I think in the short term, however, it's undeniable that China is sitting back and enjoying the show. Um, all of this is undermining the West, it's undermining the United States, it's undermining the EU, it's undermining NATO, of course, and the Chinese are obviously very pleased uh, to see that. But there is one important point, and that is China wants to dominate the Euro-Asian economy. And this uh, crisis is going to play a, place a lot of stress on the Eurasian economy in the next, in the foreseeable future. So I think there is a limit to how pleased the Chinese are going to be with uh, this Russian irredentism. I think, um, you know, at some point the, Russian, the Chinese will let the Russians know in private at least that they may have gone a little bit too far and that this is not actually in China's long-term interest either. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm starting to pick up questions also from the live stream and I'll go back to even Nicholas. There are uh, two sets of questions. First one, it's connected to uh, our discussion in the previous round about how far and how fast can Europe decouple from Russia, even if it wanted to? Do you have any assessment of what immediate economic damage, uh, especially Central Europe, but also other parts of Europe might have, given the uh, current state of sanctions? And the second question concerns the economic support that uh, many European countries and the EU as an institution are promising to Ukraine. If the scenario that Charles elaborated, uh, uh, the scenario of where a puppet government is installed in Kiev, will the puppet government also receive the economic support that the West is offering? Or if not, how this support can be implemented for the people of Ukraine? Yeah, thank you. Let me start with the, first, with the second question. Uh, possibility of the puppet regime in, in Ukraine. Till now, but of course, we, we don't know. In Ukraine now, everything is possible. But my feeling is, and especially from knowing the situation, I lived five years in, 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 in Ukraine, in Kiev. I know what are becoming, I'm still searching the situation there even before this, this conflict, which means I know what are public opinion polls regarding uh, support of the Euro Atlantic Station, regarding connect, uh, relations with Russia. I, regarding ability uh, of the people to fight actively, resist the aggressors and so and so, which means I, I don't think that this this alternative to have puppet government in situation when majority strong majority and now even more unified the nation against the aggressor is there, which means with with a strong army and of course the Russian army is much stronger and equipment is much more modern and, and, and bigger than Ukrainian, which means I can imagine to occupy the country. But one thing is to occupy, another thing is to sustain the occupation. And in this regard, you know, we have the only one pro-Russian party in the last elections received 11%. In public opinion polls, the popularity of this party is the same, around 12, 13%, not more. All other political parties have this pro-Western uh, geopolitical orientation. And it is not in the Ukraine situation like in Syria and other countries where you have two uh, proportionally big parts of society, which is in the civil war. Which means in these circumstances, I really cannot imagine how some kind of puppet uh, government took there by, by Putin in this, in this situation can even, even exist. But I don't know, but I just, just don't know. Imagine this, yeah? But your first question, decoupling from Russia and sanctions. Yeah, for Europe, that it is necessary to stop dependency on the Russian energy source. It will be, of course, not possible to do in, in a few weeks or months, 
But there are some possible significant steps which can be done at least, let's say, till next heating season, which we have seven, seven, eight months till then. For instance, what is, of course, question will, which I hope will be again on the table are German nuclear power plants. Because, of course, closing them needs more gas. Second question, which will be on the table, they are the uh, these stocks on the of the under underground uh, stocking of the of the gas, which they are in, uh, especially in Germany and in Austria, they are either owned by Gazprom or they are long term uh, hired by by um, rented rented by by Gazprom. And Gazprom created now the current energy crisis also by this step that he didn't. Uh, fulfill this this uh, this uh, gas stock under underground gas stock uh, sufficiently, which means it will be very legitimate question now how to nationalize or how to took the ownership of this of these uh, um, stocks uh, underground stocks to uh, from from Russia and how to have control over this. Uh, resources of the of the of the gas and oil and of course another is to use every possible alternatives for be supplied by 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 gas regarding gas and and, and oil of course regarding um, sanctions yeah i agree that sanctions itself will not solve the problem but i don't think that sanctions will be not important i mean it could be even decisive why i will explain on figures just this relatively very weak sanctions, which have been imposed after annexation of Crimea in 2014, have had a really significant impact on the Russian economy. By the estimate of IMF, it was about 1, 1.5% of GDP yearly. By estimates of Anders Aslund, it was even much more. It was about 2%, 2.5%. What we know, we don't know exactly, but what we know exactly is that Russian economy is stagnating from this 2013. We know that in dollar terms, Russian GDP significantly decreased from $2,300 billion in 2013 to $1,500 billion in 2020, uh, 2020. And what is even more important, uh, living of standard of, of, of Russian people decreased real income between 2013 and 2020 officially by official figures decreased by 11 percent but there are estimates that it was even more because now these figures are not very very reliable which means if we are speaking now about much more much stronger uh, sanctions it is clear that it will have impact on the on the social and economic situation of the russians it is also clear that from this 2013, in 2013, popularity of Putin came up because Crimea and propaganda around again in Crimea, but from that time, it's going down. It's going down, speci especially because this social and economic situation of the, of the Russian people is worsening. Now we have also this, this uh, of course, in, in Russia now, it will be even more restrictive and, and, and the dictatorship and, and uh, uh, cruel, not the cruel, cruel regime against those who are independent or even opposition. But despite of this situation, we have seen that people came to the streets and they protested. More than one thousand people have been arrested in in Moscow. I remember when Czechoslovakia was invaded. Invaded, uh, it was 68, 1968. Five people came to protest in the in the Moscow uh, Red Square. Now there are thousands of people in 50, uh, uh, 50 towns, despite of these uh, consequences, not only theoretical, but real consequences against, against them. We know that there is very big, very significant difference between popularity of the Putin and his regime among old people who are dependent on the official media, media and official propaganda, and among young people who are much, much more critically uh, oriented to, to Putin. And very important point is that it seems to be that Putin expected that his war against Ukraine will be blitzkrieg, that it will be 12 hours and then they will have everything under control. Now it is 
clear that it will be no blitzkrieg. It will be a long war, and they will they will lose a lot of a lot of people. Even yesterday, first day of aggression, it was not all day. It started at five o'clock in the morning. Uh, during uh, yesterday's nineteen or twenty hours, eight hundred. Russian soldiers died. This is estimation of this is figure from Ukrainian sources, which means we don't know if it is exact. But it seems to be that usually uh, aggressor has much much bigger human losses as this this part which is which is uh, which is defending uh, itself, which means it will be extremely I think extremely unpopular in in Russia. All these consequences because by by sanctions these consequences all kind of costs for the normal Russian people will be, will be, in my opinion, enormous. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, Ivan. It's indeed very important what you're saying, because on the one hand, there has been always this traditional maneuver in Russia that we sell foreign policy as the bread and butter of life for people. But of course, if there is no bread and butter, you can only sell foreign policy for so long. And so, this infamous meeting of Putin with the business circle and his own security council shows very clearly that neither the uh, business elites nor the public supports the war that much. Of course, Putin still has the machinery of the state propaganda and he can still work with the public opinion, but the starting point is so low that it's likely going to take him quite some time to revert the current negative trend at home. Uh, but with that, I'm gonna move back to uh, Ambassador Minutoritsa and follow up uh, uh, with a question on the political unity. And the question that somebody is asking on Twitter is, uh, how long do you think the West can sustain the political unity? It seems that the aggression is pretty clear right now. So in a way it's unified the West, but uh, assuming that the situation in Ukraine comes down, will we go back to business as usual with Russia in a year or two, as it happened a few years after Crimea? Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the previous speaker for this information, because of course you in Slovakia, perhaps you know better than us uh, um, certain things about Russia that we all know, we know the, the overall picture, but this information about the, the economic situation, about the uh, uh, power of buying of the citizens is very, is very relevant, I think. It's very, it's very important and we have to, do, to know more about that, frankly speaking, I think. Uh, because this is an important element of the entire equation. But I would like to make a, a few general comments, if you like, uh, if you would allow me to do so, uh, in the sense that, um, uh, frankly speaking, in the last uh, two or three weeks, let's say, you know, since this crisis really exploded, one month perhaps, uh, we, I mean, um, in general, let's say, Western analysts, uh, including myself, I have to, uh, to admit, have been trying to play down a little bit the problem, you know, saying, you know, we have not to use the uh, high tones, uh, um, we have to solve these things by diplomacy, uh, perhaps, you know, a few concessions to Russia will be sold inside by Putin as a big advantage, you know, and in the end, how is it possible that we really think about a war, this is ridiculous, he wants something else. He's really not concerned about Ukraine. You know, what? how can he invade a country of 50 million people, etc.? Well, we were, we were wrong, in fact. I admit it. You know, we were in good faith, but we were wrong. And uh, we were, in a way, not victims, because I don't think we were victims, but we have listened, we have let this Russian narrative, narrative goes, go on, you know? And this Russia nugget uh, narrative is a narrative that now we have to counter, I think, uh, because that's a different moment. Uh, and the Russian narrative, as you know very well in Slovakia and in Bratislava, is that in fact, you know, Russia has been mistreated uh, by Europe, by NATO especially, by the Americans, uh, um, that uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union was a, an enormous tragedy. And we in the West took advantage of that and in spite and not respecting uh, Russian interests, we really humiliated them. And so the moment has come for Russia to come back into the international scene with a new uh, prestige, with a new strength. And uh, we have to understand that on the West. 
and to review completely the map of security in Central Europe. Although, or we, we let these things go on for a while. And I think now we have to counter that because this is not really what the situation is. You know, in Slovakia, you are well placed to say that uh, because in fact, uh, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union uh, and the uh, Comic-Con and the Warsaw Pact, I mean, your countries, uh, Czechoslovakia at the time, had all the rights to choose what you wanted. I mean, you know, it is ridiculous to think that this was aggressive against Russia. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, you know, nor from a political, nor from a military point of view. So we have to say, and in fact, they have lost the, 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 the Cold War in the end. It's communists that failed, you know, and we may regret or not, but this is history and you can't, you know, rewind history uh, as you like. Because, because they're generational, and this is very important. The second thing, so this is a counter narrative that we have to, 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 to impose because this is important in, in today's world. And the second thing is that uh, it, se looks to, it seems to me, as a, you know, let's put it that way, professional in foreign policy, that um, Russia is uh, uh, one century back in a way because. Uh, it looks like they have a foreign policy 19th century style, uh, where the acquisition of territory is uh, the most important thing, you know. And we know by history, we all started the books of history. In the past, it was like that, you know. Every empire wanted to have more land, you know, and they come back. But today's world is different, you know, and Putin is not on this line. In today's world, the elements of power are different. They are technology, they are information, they are uh, culture, um, data, whatever, but not certainly the control of territory as it was before. Uh, and, the and the third thing is that we in the West, uh, speaking about uh, my country, but I imagine also many other countries, we probably have to discover again that security is important because we have lived after 1945 under the illusion that, you know, a war in Europe is not possible. That, you know, we had strategies in the past, but they are, we are above that, national aim has disappeared. Uh, in, in a way or in another, we live in liberal societies. And so by compromise, we will, you know, just, you know, make progress all the time and so on. And we have to, to review this concept, you know, because this is the first time I think after 1945 that we have a real war in Europe because Yugoslavia was a different thing, you know, it was a civil war and even Kosovo was an air campaign. It was not really a war. So there is not, no comparison. So uh, the fact of uh, unity, because in fact is you, the, the basis of your question, uh, Alina, uh, was about unity. I think that unity is reinforced in a way, it's a, it's a paradox, if you like, it's reinforced by this, uh, by this uh, um, incredible act of aggression that nobody thought a week ago it was possible under normal circumstances. And then, of course, sanctions are important. Yes, of course, they are important. And, uh, yeah. But uh, in, the, in, in the past, the Russians have lived under the illusion that to be a superpower was sufficient uh, and they could suffer, uh, you know, economic hardship, but the pride of being Russians was superior to that. And this is probably something that doesn't work today, doesn't work today. And uh, you, you mentioned NATO before, uh, I know both NATO and European Union very well. I, NATO is in a process of reform uh, because uh, would there be a, be a new Secretary General at the end of the year? Um, a new strategic concept is being discussed in this week's. Uh, a, pro a process for a more political NATO is underway, is difficult, but you know, NATO was founded in 1949 by 12 countries only. And now we are 30, so it is clear that you have to review uh, the strategic concept and you have to review the political unity of it. But we are working in this direction, and it is a paradox, and of course I'm very sorry to say that, but uh, Putin is reinforcing our, 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 our drive. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, what you're saying about the um, Russian vision of power is definitely very important for the region. Uh, I remember when there was discussion and there are now increasingly discussion also within NATO and with, between the allies about the transformation of power, importance of new technologies and other 
uh, elements in the concept of power. And what Putin seems to be saying is that uh, I don't like your concept of power. Conventional forces is what matters right now. And this is exactly how I'm going to redefine what you think power is and prove you wrong. So we feel that acute, acutely in the region for sure. And that brings me back to Charles. And Charles, you made, made a remark about the strategic autonomy and what Central Europeans think about it. Actually, uh, Central Europeans were never too in armored by the concept of strategic autonomy, Not especially in the way as that was formulated uh, without too much detail on substance by President Macron. So definitely there is this continuous feeling that uh, we do love the European pillar of NATO. Let's make sure that we do collectively spend more on defense and we can be uh, valuable contributors to defense, but we do not have illusions that we can do that without the American allies as well. But uh, I want to address to you a more specific question on this matter. And so how does this thing can change in Spain specifically? And whether Spain now has any plans to be more active also on the Eastern Front as well? And thank you also for mentioning the disinformation. This is definitely goes back to what Ivan was describing about the situation in Slovakia and half of the population um, being not quite confident who is actually uh, causing the trouble in Ukraine. So this information is definitely one part of it. So I want to reframe the question about it and uh, ask you for practical advice. What can we do to counter it? Not only from the point of view of technical capabilities of removing trolls, or we increasingly see a set of countries banning uh, Russia Today channels and other Russian state propaganda channels, but what can we do more in terms of uh, communicating the counter narrative uh, on the democratic side as well in practice? Well, that's a big menu you've laid out for me. Thank you. Um, let me just, before I answer your questions, go, very, go back very quickly to some of the things that have been said. I, I defer to Ivan's a greater knowledge of the Ukraine, of course. Um, and I very much hope you are right, Ivan. Um, I'm just concerned, you know, that there are... Um, let, let's, let's be honest, you know, crime pays is the conclusion that Putin took away from Syria 2015. Um, he, knocked, uh, he, he supported the Bashar al-Assad regime uh, with very little cost to, to Russia. And um, Russia now has much more influence in the region than it did. Remember at the time we were all saying, Syria will be Russia's quagmire. And of course, now we are hearing people saying, Ukraine will be Russia's quagmire. And I fully take your point, 43 million people, 600,000 uh, square kilometers, it's a big territory to control and so on. But there are a lot of intermediate things one can do. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a puppet regime. You can have partition, you can have partial occupation and so on. So, but I hope you're right. Um, as far as the, the I think the, the Russian economy is actually more resilient than, than we believed it was. And ultimately, in a sense, it doesn't matter too much because Putin um, will always place geopolitical considerations ahead of the well-being of his nation and so on. Um, obviously, yes, in the medium to long term, uh, there can be economic hardship and this can encourage um, the growth of Russian opposition. But uh, given that this is an increasingly authoritarian regime, I think it's, it would be unwise for us to, to put too much uh, hope in, in that cause. Um, Elena, as far as your question is concerned, um, well, Spain has caught, find itself in a, finds itself now in an interesting position. As you know, it will be hosting uh, the NATO summit in June, and we as a think tank will be hosting the side event, um, which, will be, which traditionally takes place together with NATO summits, together with our colleagues at the Munich Security Conference, the Atlantic Council, and the German Marshall Fund. Um, I think the really important point, of course, is what is this new strategic concept actually going to say, Ambassador, would be my question to you. You know, we were very comfortable tinkering with the document that we had um, that was more or less on the table after Christmas, and now this has dramatically changed everything. Um, you know, before the Ukrainian invasion, we were worried about how we would deal with China in this document. And now, obviously, that is a far less important point. We were worried about slightly esoteric things, such as what should NATO's role be in the struggle against climate change. And I hope that will definitely take a back seat now. In other words, it's back to basics. We have to concentrate on the core um, tasks of NATO. In other words, NATO 
as a security um, alliance. And in a sense, of course, we have Putin to thank for this. We now have a sharper focus. NATO has a clear raison d'etre, and uh, that is no bad thing, because frankly, I think we were in serious danger of losing our, our narrative. So Spain supports this. As you know, Elena of Spain has deployed um, fighter planes in the Baltics. Uh, it is sending um, a military presence to Bulgaria. It is sending ships to the Black Sea. Um, we conducted a poll last week at El Cano, which shows that Spanish support for NATO membership at, is at an all-time high of 80% of the Spanish population. Our poll also shows that Spaniards now regard Russia as, and this is a massive change, Russia is now seen as a major threat, the main threat to Spanish security. Um, and this was so striking that uh, the, it received the uh, attention of the Russian embassy. So I suppose my phone will be hacked any minute now uh, and my, uh, you, this communication may, may be suddenly interrupted, but um, they had the audacity to accuse us as an institution of encouraging um, Russophobic attitudes in the Spanish population. Well, you know, surprise, surprise. Um, so yes, I think, you know, if anything, as the ambassador was saying, if anything, if there is a silver lining in this very dark cloud, um, the invasion and, and po possible occupation of Ukraine will strengthen um, the alliance in the short term. Um, again, I, I insist that the, the um, strategic concept now really has to deliver uh, much with, with far greater urgency than was the case before. And I think this is also true of the EU's strategic compass. Uh, the draft text that we saw before the invasion was frankly rather underwhelming, if I may be honest. Um, and I hope that will now be rewritten to give it a bit of uh, teeth. Thank you. Sorry, Thank about you, this sir. information, um, apart from having been outed personally as a US spy and a British spy, by Russia Today and Sputnik. Um, my knowledge of disinformation is rather limited, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. Uh, and I'll go back quickly to Ambassador Minuturizzo because Charles uh, uh, actually posed the question to you, uh, what should be and what will be the concept of strategic concept? Do you agree with Charles' assessment that we're back to basis in terms of delivering on the basic duties of uh, NATO? Well, you know, what um, Charles Power said before on the fact that NATO should be focusing on its own core business is very right, in fact. Uh, I, I fully agree with that, uh, because perhaps in the past couple of years, a few years, we have discussed things which are relevant, but perhaps they're not so relevant for NATO, you know, because, yes, climate change is very important, but it's not the main concern of NATO, let's put, let's put it that way, you know to be diplomatic, I mean. Uh, now, we are, the, the, the reality is that this war in Ukraine is in counter direction <laughs> to what NATO was thinking of, because NATO, uh, a year before, or a few weeks before, if you like, was thinking how to renew itself in a way, you know? Because you had, uh, I remember when I was in NATO, there was this, uh, 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 British saying that uh, Charles Power knows better than me, uh, saying, you know, you don't, uh, uh, you don't, uh, um, old dogs don't learn new tricks, something like that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> perhaps the other way around, but I mean, uh, <laughs> we know what you're talking about. And uh, NATO so has to, was in the direction of saying, you know, now we have to look at security in a different way. Because the idea is that the new threat, uh, quote unquote, is China, is in the Indo-Pacific region. And so how to address that? And of course, this is a very difficult and very complicated question, you know. And the entire effort of NATO, of people thinking about that, and the strategic was how to address this, you know. Is China a competitor? Is China possibly a partner in certain ways? in which way to address the issue, not a cold war, but what we have to do to have partners in the Pacific, what kind of partners, how, and then Putin comes here and say, I want to, I want to cry in a bank, you know, and we are all taken by surprise because it looks 
looked like a ridiculous thing before, you know. Uh, so uh, I think the 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 is a very difficult issue. I think, as a matter of fact, because you know, human beings are limited. We are all limited, and we cannot do too many things at the time. So we have in Madrid. Uh, in 29 and 30 of June, it's only three months uh, from now, this big summit where perhaps even in the Pacific countries will be invited. It's not decided yet. Uh, I think not in the end, but I'm not sure. It will depend. A new strategic concept will be will be approved. We don't know exactly how, you know, because the present one is also something not very old. And uh, Certainly, what NATO has to do, but this is the most difficult put, uh, thing, is to put, uh, how can I say, political cohesion back. Because, of course, you have 30 countries and you have different views. So if you speak about countries like mine, like Italy, for instance, we try to be a good ally because, of course, an Italian perspective, in theory, you would say, or in practice, is more to the south, you know, to the Arab region, to Africa, et cetera, et cetera. But we understand very well this is kind of be done in like this. So, you know, Italy is participating in all NATO missions and operations, so including in the Baltic, including in Poland, and it will continue to do this because this is a very important thing. But how NATO will be able to tackle Putin's on Ukraine on one side, which is, you know, something going on, and I don't want satellite to diminish it. And the issues of terrorism in Sahel, which is exploding like a new Afghanistan, uh, the loss of Afghanistan on your side. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think we have all to, to concentrate on that and to find, try, hope that our leaders, our political are wise enough to concentrate on few basic things as I think was the suggestion made by, by, by Charles Powell, and, and, and have a comprehensive view, but without forgiving Russia for what they are doing in the end. Thank you so much, Ambassador. We have a couple of minutes left, so I'll use this opportunity to go back to Ivan Miklos, maybe with a bit of um, unusual question for your specialization. One of the uh, participants is asking, how fast do you think the EU countries will start spending 2% on defense? I know you're not maybe a defense expert, but you definitely know the financial requests that are coming for the budget. What is your assessment on this? Yeah, no. I, I think that now at least Central European countries will very quickly increase their de defense capacities because in reality our defense capacities now are much lower than have been 30 years ago or, or 20 years ago for instance uh, number of soldiers but not only because they have been kind of uh, thinking okay we are part of NATO we, we, we are safe and which means it will be I think all civilized world will will spend now more which means and this is very important because that even without sanctions, even without any any new sanctions, current situation, new current situation, war in Ukraine, Russian war in Ukraine, will have negative economic uh, impact on the societies. First, because of course it is increasing uh, prices of oil and gas, it is increasing inflation. We know that even without this, without this additional reason, current inflation was highest during the uh, last 20 or 30 years ago. And it is create, it creates a lot of problems because it is real threat that this risk of stagflation will be even speeding up because national banks will have to react by increasing interest rates. And of course, it will have negative impact to the, to the economic growth. Uh, and, and another reason is this increasing uh, uh, expenditures to to military, because we know that one of the problem of the current situation is too high indebtedness. And now it will be even necessary even more to spend. And if you are in this kind of situation, the countries have very high debt, public debt, growth will be decreased and necessary expenditures for the, for the military will be increased. Of course, it is even worsening the, the current situation. And you have to add to this also 
uh, direct and indirect costs of the sanctions, because sanctions will have cost not only for Russia. For Russia, it, the costs will be much, much multiply higher than for those countries who are imposing, but also for our countries, uh, the consequences will be there. But this is something what we have to pay. And this is because now it is now, you know, even now I have to say I'm an economist. And if I'm asking now what is my opinion on the sanctions and, and this kind of, as your question was, I'm telling now money are not the most important. Now, much more important things are on the table, not on the table. There are people's life. There is, there is freedom. There is independence and there is there is integrity of, of the country and not only Ukraine. Because on one side, you know, I agree that yes, of course, we are in NATO, we are in, fortunately, we are in the different situation. But who knows? Who knows if you have this kind of, for instance, uh, Putin is openly saying about the returning of this imperial power and influence of the Russia, of the Soviet Union, but he, he is speaking about, about Russia, which means of course, that countries like Baltic countries or even Slovakia cannot feel themselves themselves uh, safe, even if you have domestically so strong and very 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 let's say non-standard opposition, which is fueling this kind of opinions that this kind of pro-Russian and I, I use better better not pro-Russian and not Russian narrative but Kremlin's narrative or Putin's narrative because this this policy is uh, going against the interests of Russia and the Russians. It is, it is Putin's strange, irresponsible crime, a crime policy in this, in this regard. But answering your question, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure that despite of difficult economic and social consequences of current situation, uh, which will be even worsening because this Russian aggression, it will be necessary to give more. Thank you so much, Ivan. Uh, we're out of time, so we have to be wrapping up, uh, but that was a perfect summary of the conversation. There are much more important things now at stake than money, and money is the cheapest price we can pay for all of it. So thank you very much, everybody, for uh, the very constructive exchange of ideas. We will con continue uh, doing everything we can to support Ukraine and the important things that are at stake now, and we hope to see you at our discussion soon again. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.